Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever we are in the world. A very warm welcome to Meet Menaka, episode 93, Cancer Screening in Gynecology with Mr. Jun Ching Wong. He is a consultant in gynecology. First, let us talk about why are we talking about cancer screening in gynecology? Because being proactive in the screening process is vital for everyone. Cancer is generally a disease in which the cells in the body grow out of control. When the cancer starts in a woman's reproductive organ, it is called gynecological cancer. The five main types of gynecological cancers are, as much as my limited knowledge, cervical, ovarian, uterine, vaginal, and vulvar cancer. And apparently, there's a sixth type I only found out now when I was doing research for this, that is a, a rare fallopian tube cancer. That goes to show how much we don't know. Of course, I'm not a doctor, but I'm still in the healthcare, but we still don't know being a woman as well. I know that some people say only cervical cancer can be found out. So why should we find out about other, other ones? Because we can't go to a gynecology and find out. I'm sure there are things Dr. Jun will tell, which we perhaps don't know. And always it is important to recognize the warning signs and learn if there's anything we can do to reduce the risk as well. Prevention is always better than cure. So hence, we are going to talk about it. Let me dive into a bit more about the speaker, Mr. Jun Ching Wong. He is a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist with special interest in gynecology at the Newham University Hospital. A bit about the show itself. It is an open to all engaging online talk show that celebrates life by empowering you. It is a social initiative supported by a team of like-minded individuals with a mission to bring impactful and lasting social change across borders by bridging the communication gap between the people and communities. By learning from subject experts like today, and change makers through open heart-to-heart -heart conversations and also through sharing the stories of ordinary people who lead extraordinary lives. This show encourages and promotes greater awareness and understanding and resolution of the issues that plague modern day life. So let us empower you and others to emerge, evolve and elevate your life individually and collectively. The show goes live every Sunday at two o'clock UK time over Zoom video conferencing. Please share this with others so that a wider audience can benefit from it. And please do support us and subscribe to the Meet Menaka YouTube channel so that we can make a bigger impact. Dr. Jun graduated from International Medical University, IMU Malaysia, and moved to the UK in 2014, acquired MRCOG in 2014. It is an honor and privilege to have him on the show today. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It is my honor to, to, to join this talk show and, and to speak. And I, I think what you've been talking about resonates very well with what I'm trying to achieve today, to increase awareness for women to take charge of their health and also, you know, just to bust any myth around cancer screening and hopefully, you know, increase awareness and, and improve healthcare. Thank you so much. So without further ado, let's dive into the topic of discussion for today. To begin with, what are gynecological cancer? And are the gynecological cancers hereditary? And who should get the genetic testing done? Like you said, there are many, uh, there are six types of gynecological cancers. Uh, it's specific to each part of the female genital system from down upwards would be the vulva, which is the external, the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, then connecting to the fallopian tube and also the ovaries. The ones that we know the most or have studied the most is ovarian and uterine cancer can be hereditary. And ovarian cancer and uterine cancer is also linked with breast cancer. So for people or for any woman with a strong family history of any this type of cancers in like this, should, um, especially if it's all first degree relatives like your mom, your sister, and especially if they've had cancer when they were much younger, like in the 40s, uh, 
uh, towards the six between 40s and 60s, you should speak to your gynecologist or your GP about uh, your potential risk of genetic in, or hereditary cancers and also genetic testing. The most well-known uh, well cancers or genetic defect is called the BRCA. Uh, I think I think made famous quite a long time ago by Angelina Jolie, uh, where you know she she was tested positive for the gene and therefore she had uh, prophylactic mastectomy and her ovaries removed. Um, that is still the same recommendation if you do have the BRCA gene, um, but provided obviously that you completed your family and you know you reach a point in life where reproduction is not an issue anymore. Uh, uterine cancer is linked to bowel cancer. So if there's a family history of Lynch syndrome, uh, it's quite rare amongst the uh, the Asian and South Asian, but you know, if there's a family history of bowel cancer or bowel polyps, I think they can look into uterine cancer. And cervical cancer are usually not hereditary. Cervical cancer is purely because it's due to the HPV virus. So if there's a if there are family members with cervical cancer, you don't have to worry about you having a higher risk. Um, I hope that answers the first question. Thank you so much. The question is, yes, we are aware now that what cancer we can get. Can gynecological cancer be prevented is the first question I'm sure everybody has in their mind. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. The answer is yes and no. Um, the best example will be cervical cancer. It is the one cancer that's studied the most and the one cancer that we know how it progresses. So with recent evidence, we know that most cervical cancer is due to the HPV virus. And that occurs, and we found HPV virus in 99% of cervical cancers. So knowing this means that if we can detect HPV virus early, especially the high-risk one that causes cancer, and treat this virus or, or the pathology, we can prevent cervical cancer from happening. And that's why the smear test or the screening smear screening program is so effective in reducing cancer. In the UK, the the program is very well established. It's been around for many years. And from coming from a person who practiced in two different countries, in a developing country and in, in a developed country like UK, I can see that in the UK, there's a lot of a lot less advanced cervical cancer and a lot of pre-cancer diagnosis and treatment. In terms of helping yourself as a, as a woman, I think if you're not in a country with established screening program, you should take charge of your health and make sure you get cervical smears every three years, at least every three years from the age of 26 to uh, your 50. And after 50, you can have it every five years. Uh, the reason why after 50, the, the uh, frequency is uh, reduced is because the peak age of cervical cancer is between 35 to 45. Um, so moving on from cervical cancer to ovarian cancer, this is another big debate or a lot of research has been put into it because ovarian cancer is the deadliest of all cancers uh, in the gynecology system. Ovarian cancer and fallopian tube cancer, uh, which you mentioned earlier, are more or less very similar in terms of treatment and staging. And there's even recent study that says that ovarian cancer originated from the fallopian tubes. Now, if you've been to a GP uh, or, or gynecologist, you would probably would have been offered CA125 uh, as like a screening tool. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a very good screening tool. It's not specific to ovarian cancer. It can be raised in many, many, many uh, other reasons, and therefore it increases anxiety. The reason why I brought that up was there's a very big study that concluded in the recent years, and it was running in the UK for a good 16 years, where they uh, offered screening with scan and CA125 to uh, uh, about 200,000 women. And uh, 
between having active screening and no active screening, there has no had there still not been any improvement in in mortality from ovarian cancer. So there's still no good screening tool for ovarian cancer, unfortunately. Um, uterine cancer, on the other hand, uh, is uh, usually diagnosed at the early stage. That's because you start to bleed. And with any abnormal bleeding, you will go see your doctors, your GP or your gynecologist. And from there you get investigated. So I would say uterine cancer may not be screened or prevented, but can be treated very early if you are proactive with seeking help. And if treated early, uterine cancer is curable. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, because I think this knowledge is so important that it can be preventable. There are things we can do. So hence you have told that. So what can I do to then lower my risk of gynecological cancer or anyone for that matter? How Mm. can someone, a woman, reduce the chances? So let's start with uh, cervical cancer again. Uh, Cervical cancer, because it's linked to the HPV virus and the HPV virus is transmitted via intercourse, by, via sexual intercourse, the way you can protect yourself is if you're meeting someone new or you're starting a new relationship is to have a barrier like a condom to protect yourself, even if you're on any other types of contraception. Uh, it's women with more sexual partners are at higher risk of having high-risk HPV. Uh, so, um, so I guess... <laughs> It, it's a bit redundant because it depends on everyone's personal lifestyle, but it's to be careful and reduce the amount of uh, sexual partner. Um, other forms of reducing risk of uh, cervical cancer is to go for your smear test. Uh, and if it's detected early, we can treat the precancerous cell and therefore not leading to cancer. Uh, when it comes to ovarian and uterine cancer, uh, using contraceptive pills, the combined contraception can reduce the risk of uh, of, of them. Uh, however, with using contraceptive pill, it increases the risk of breast cancer and cervical cancer as well. So it's it's a bit of a, I think it depends on the lifestyle. The take home message for that is when you stop using contraception, for example, if you most most people would use contraception when they're younger uh, and then when they're more sexually active, uh, therefore reducing the risk of ovarian cancer and uterine cancer in the later life. Uh, the good thing is once you stop using it, your risk of breast cancer and cervical cancer reduces, but the protection that you get from using it before continues. So using contraception in a way is... Um, Prevent, you can prevent ovarian cancer or reduce your risk of ovarian cancer. Obesity is a very big risk factor, uh, risk factor for ovarian and uterine cancer. That's because with when in obesity, your hormones are a bit more haywire and you may have a lot more high estrogen as well. And all this promotes uh, ovarian and uterine cancer. Smoking is another one. Smoking is linked to all cancers and in gynecology, especially cervical cancer. So reduce stopping smoking would be a very good uh, proactive measure. Um, I think that's that's about That's plenty. It. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is something new. Um, I never knew having the contraceptives would have a longer term effect. I'm sure uh, many others like me might not have known. It, it, I think it's a really good addition uh, to know as well. Thank you so much. What are the symptoms then? Okay, we have gone through the risks and you have educated us what we can do to prevent those things. What are the symptoms that should alert someone to seek medical help that, you know, put that thought in our mind, saying it might be cancer. So any um, any abnormal bleeding will be the first thing that you that always pops out in gynecology. Uh, in cervical cancer, uh, it's usually um, bleeding after intercourse or bleeding in between periods. Uh, with uterine cancer, it's usually like very heavy bleeding. 
or bleeding after the menopause. Uh, uterine cancer peak at the age of 60. So it's a disease of an older woman. So any bleeding after you stop having periods should alert, should trigger alarm bells and you should seek medical help as soon as possible. Ovarian cancer, on the other hand, is a bit tricky. Most symptoms of ovarian cancer are very vague because it's hidden within the, within the tummy. So, um, so vague symptoms like change in toilet habits, bloating should trigger you, know, uh, you to seek medical help. A lot of times bloating can be due to other things like you know, gastritis, reflux. So it makes, which makes it all the more trickier to diagnose ovarian cancer early or detect them early because most general practice doctors would say, try this, try an antacid. Uh, maybe let's see, change your diet. So I guess it, it's, it's a case of how you push, push it to, to, to your general practice. Uh, I think, uh, so I've touched a lot on all these three cancers and I'm not, really touch on vagina and vulva cancers because they're very, very rare. Uh, but uh, vulva cancers, I think uh, they don't usually, if you know, if there's an abnormal lump, anybody will seek help. But itchiness down below can be abnormal. So that's probably one thing you need to watch for, uh, especially in the older woman. Thank you so much. I was just really wanted to talk about how aware are GPs? Because including mm. me, I'm sure many women can um, yeah. perhaps relate to it. Like when they have bleeding, do the GPs uh, like uh, put it to a uh, side and think oh, they have to it's a, they have to wait and see other things, or do they actually refer to a gynecologist as soon as possible? Very good question. Uh, I can only speak so in speaking from my experience in the UK because UK has a very established GP practice. The way it works is that. Uh, each area or each catchment area with the GP uh, is linked to the hospitals. Like Newham uh, has a catchment area, and from Newham, what we would do is we'll send, we'll give GP a kind of like a referral form, and in the referral form are the criteria that they need to watch out for. And it's usually a blanket rule, so we cast a wide net and we catch a lot of people. So, um, which also means that you know I see a lot of people who are actually normal. Uh, and but they do come in with a lot of anxiety. I, but the trade off is I can catch a lot of people and then find the ones that really need my help. And so GPs know, and there's a strict referral criteria like if there's any abnormal bleeding, especially bleeding after intercourse, if any abnormal bleeding after the menopause, any CA125 that is even raised by one point, they get referred in straight away. And any abnormal lump that the GP doesn't know or not, not, um, is not familiar with will be sent in straight away. And the national target is to see these patients the moment I receive the referral in two weeks or within two weeks. So the system is good. I do admit that there are some delays from COVID and I think with COVID, a lot of GPs are also not doing face-to-face -face consultation. So I do see victims of COVID in that sense in the recent years. Uh, one one or two years, but uh, I think if you insist or keep pursuing or persevere and that your symptoms are worrying, eventually you get yourself into the door for gynecologists and you will see someone like me to, to make sure that everything's fine. Yes, because I know of someone who had bleeding and the GP had told uh, it's okay to wait and um, luckily a gynecologist intervened, yeah. but not all the time, uh, you know, they will know someone. So that's the reason I asked the question. Mm, it is very unfortunate. I, I personally know someone as well. And it's, it's just, it, it's more it's more difficult when you're younger because you're expected, expected to have abnormal or irregular bleeding when you're younger. So in, in, in those scenarios, like let's say if you have daughters or if they're younger listeners, then you just need to, you know, look at all your risk factors and see how, whether you're at higher risk of cancers, especially obesity, smoking, uh, PCOS uh, for, for uterine cancer. If you could say, tell uh, what PCOS is, is because some oh, of yes, the audience might not be aware yeah. of it. So PCOS is a polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's a benign 
issue. It's linked with irregular bleeding, infertility, and it's a it's a condition where the ovaries are not ovulating. So when your ovary do not ovulate, you don't get your regular cycles. You know every you know every few weeks, and because of that, your estrogen levels are higher. Uh, if you don't ovulate, you don't get the progesterone that protects you from uterine cancer. Uh, so uh, uh, mo most younger women with irregular periods may have some element of PCOS, uh, and it's worth uh, looking into it or seeing a gynecologist to, to diagnose PCOS. PCOS is also linked with diabetes and other me metabolic syndrome. So it's uh, it's a good way to take charge of your health. Uh, if you notice that, you know, your periods are always irregular, you may have difficulty getting pregnant and getting diagnosed with PCOS will help you in the long, long run from, from benign conditions to cancer. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think you have really gone in depth and educated us. So thank you for that. Knowing that, are there any medications then we should be aware of that will increase or reduce uh, the risk of uh, gynecological cancer? Because though we do have to take medications, most of them have an uh, element of the risk. Are there anything like that for gynecological cancer? Yeah. Uh, so like I mentioned before, the con combined contraceptive pill is one that can reduce the risk. Uh, that's something that, uh, you know, you important to take as uh, in pcos women you can uh, some some women are treated with uh, progesterone tablets uh, to to induce periods and that also helps you with re reducing uterine cancer the bare minimum for any woman to have a period is once every three months so if you miss your period for three months go to your GP or gynecologist and get a course of medication to induce your period because the lining inside the womb needs to be shed to protect you. Uh, one important medication that I would like to mention is called tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is used in breast cancer to, especially after the breast cancer has been, di has been diagnosed and fully treated with surgery. Uh, as some uh, if the breast cancer is estrogen sensitive, uh, the woman will be prescribed tamoxifen to reduce recurrence of breast cancer. So, however, tamoxifen works the other way in the womb, and it makes increases the estrogen in the womb, therefore increases risk of womb cancer. So, if you're on tamoxifen, if someone is on tamoxifen and you have any abnormal bleeding, you should alert your doctor. Thank you so much. Um, it, it is so important, isn't it? This, this more, more and more of us are on one medication or the other mm -hmm. to prevent a lot of things or many things. And then, you know, need to know what kind of effect it can have on other, um, uh, other health conditions or side effects, really. Thank you so much. For example, if the GP tells someone that they have abnormal cells in their smear test because, as you mentioned, uh, in the UK, we do have the smear test um, in every three years or every two years accordingly. Should someone be worried? So the, the point of the smear test is to catch precancerous cell. So my message is don't worry, as in, because what I end up, what I personally experience is when I see patients with abnormal smears, they always come in very anxious. And the first thing they think about is cancer. So because the smear test is such a well-established tool, a screening tool, a lot of times what we're catching are pre-cancer cells. So I think it's very important to know that you don't have cancer. However, you have abnormal cells that can either become normal by itself because it is an infection or it needs extra help or treatment from the, the gynecologist to cut it out so that it doesn't have any chance of progressing into cancer. So uh, the, the key message is don't think about cancer, but go for all the appointments that are, that are booked in for you. Thank you so much for that. The next uh, question I have in mind is, 
someone scans uh, 125 level is uh, one to five, I think CA 125 level is elevated. Does that mean someone has cancer? Mm-hmm. So, I think- you know, so sometimes people become really, really nervous and worried about these things, isn't it? That's, that's also exactly my experience as well. Um, because of the criteria to the GP that says if the CA125 is even raised by one point, refer him to gynae oncology. And so a lot of women comes in anxious and thinking about cancer because the moment you do go CA125, it will come out as ovarian cancer. Uh, CA125 is raised in many, many conditions, including normal periods. So if if you even so if you do your CA125 level when you're on your day one or day five of period, it will be mildly elevated. And CA125 is also increased with other things like breast cancer, uh, benign lung conditions, liver problems. So um, so you know it's 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 a good way of picking up people uh, that has raised CA125, but it requires further investigation to make sure that we're not missing anything dangerous. And so um, again, CA125 doesn't mean you have cancer. CA125 can be considered normal, uh, even at level 300s in people with endometriosis. Usually in ovarian cancer, we will see CA125 in the much higher levels, closer to 1,000, you know, or even more than 500. So what's more important is once you know that your CA125 is raised, uh, you need to make sure you get a scan and make sure that we're not missing anything in the gynecology department. Well, thank you. Because as a dentist, for two weeks, we do refer patients. However, we do tell them we really don't know what it is. Not to be alarmed, but the prevention is better than cures, and uh, we are sending you, but we actually do not know what the cause is. Mm. Do you think GPs uh, also should be told that to share that information with the patients mm. so that they don't get alarmed? I think so, but I also how do I I mean I'm, I don't want to I'm trying not to criticize, but I think I think most GPs would have had some form of experience in gynecology and most GPs would know that CA125 is not specific. I I do sometimes wonder whether it's time constraints or the lack of you know, face-to-face communication that the message doesn't get across and patients come in very anxious. Uh, but um, what uh, in new what I've done is, you know, I mentioned the referral form. What I've also done is I've also kind of put down an extra note for GPs to read, like, please reassure your patient that this is not specific, you know, so that they don't come in scared. Uh, I have yet to see if that's taken any effect, but, you know, it's, uh, uh, I think it's it's a good, I guess it's a good way to, to, to get patients in so that we're not missing cancers. And I think, I think most importantly is, you know, for patients to take charge and not depend on the GP because of gaps in or or or, or COVID victim in, in that sense, you know. Yes, I totally agree. No one is questioning their knowledge or skills. I think it is the communication bit because it's very tempting when you're busy to say, okay, here is a different form. There you go. You will be gone in two weeks. But that two weeks can be very, very difficult for that particular yeah. person. Not only about that individual, for the entire family, right? It's, it's everybody about- when they know that they can get an appointment in two weeks and go like, what's happened? Is something wrong? Yeah. The reason I'm asking is I've been on the other side, but as I, even as a dentist, the first question patients would ask is, is something wrong with me? Mm. Do you think I, I have cancer? So mm. it is really important, uh, I think, for healthcare professionals as such, isn't it, to say to them and reassure them, we don't know is the answer, to be honest, isn't it? Mm. As a, a general dental practitioner, I don't know. I want to be safe. So I always tell, okay, I'm, I, I'd rather be safe than sorry. So I'm going to send you, but actually I have no idea. It might be just a normal variation, but, you know, it's better to get checked. Uh, there can be normal variation. I mean, who is to say that CA125 must be less than 35 to be normal? I've seen quite a few that, you know, we've done all the investigations. Nothing has come back to be cancerous. And their normal CA125 is 60. 
and you just tell them, you know, I think that's your normal and you don't have anything to worry about because we've checked everything. That's exactly the point. Thank you so much. What type of bleeding is considered abnormal? You already mentioned mm. bleeding after menopause and uh, bleeding during intercourse. Is there anything else we should be aware of? Yeah, I think I've been repeating myself a bit. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I think... I think the most important bleeding that anyone should know is bleeding after menopause because it ties into womb cancer. The incidence of womb cancer happens in someone who's after menopause. So if you have any form of bleeding, even if it's a spot, get help. I think, uh, and, and you know, it, it can be something benign. Most of the time it is, but it's, it, like I say, take charge of your health, you know, get a screen, get, get an you know, your annual MOT done, at least you're reassured that, you know, everything's fine. Um, the, and bleeding after intercourse, you know, in a, in an older woman, again, that should trigger something, but in a young woman, it's often a benign condition and makes it a bit trickier. I think, uh, I would say any bleeding that isn't cyclical has nothing to do with your ovaries or your hormones which means you need to be investigated a little bit more. Even, you know, if it comes back to be benign problem, like something that's not cancerous or dangerous, fine. But if we picked up cancer, you know, we can get it treated early. Thank you so much. As far as I am aware, we only have mammograms for women uh, for breast cancer and cervical screening. Is there anything else uh, the public doesn't know or a layman like me doesn't know, but it is available? Mm. Uh, there's no established, there's no other established um, screening test, unfortunately. Uh, but even though it's not a screening, I think any bleeding after the menopause, you know, triggering a referral to a gynecologist and having a gynecologist take a sample from the womb is a very good, uh, it's a very good pathway. It's not considered screening because we're not actively preventing the disease. But it, uterine cancer, most of the time, can be diagnosed very early. And like I said before, once diagnosed early, a lot of it are curable, not treatable. Meaning, you know, if we cut the cancer, it probably is never going to come back and bother you in, in the rest of your life, especially when we diagnose it early. Um, uh, I think there are more work or there's, then there need to be more research into ovarian cancer because until now we still have no good screening tool um, and and in also fallopian cancer it's it's more or less the same uh, it, it comes from the same same area but there's no unfortunately no no proper screening um, thank you so much you did mention about itching down below um mm -hmm. we have to um make a note or we have to think about it further what can you tell us about it? so itching down below is often not talked about uh, even uh, this is why i realize uh, in in my practice is that you know women a lot of women do experience itching or dryness but they never talk about it because it's it's a bit embarrassing and i think if if i don't offer the first step to talk about it they will never tell me you know, uh, so, and I, and I noticed it's not only in, you know, a more conservative Asian community, even in the more open, uh, you know, Caucasian, they, they are also very embarrassed or, or shy to talk about them. So I often try and engage with questions. Uh, the important, the, the reason why it's important is, uh, you can get itching from a lot of various conditions like infection or just even simple things like dryness of the skin down below. Uh, and, and you probably get that a lot more when you're younger. But when you get older, and as the skin, after the menopause especially, the skin down below can be drier and you get more itching. Uh, and the, there's a condition called lichen sclerosis of the skin in the vulva. And that usually happens in much older women, like above 60s. And lichen sclerosis, if not treated, can eventually progress to cancer, even though it's only a 1% chance. And 
because it's something that people don't talk about and just try and cope with, you may end up having people suffering from this lichen sclerosis for years and years and eventually turning into cancer. So again, back to the main message of today's talk is to take charge, seek help early so that we can get it treated. And lichen sclerosis can be easily treated with steroid creams and it can go back to normal. Other than HNS, is there anything else for that, uh, the symptoms of it? I think uh, for lichen sclerosis, uh, it's itchiness is the first one. And eventually, uh, there may be destruction of the anatomy down below, like things will start sticking together from scarring. But I, again, what I realize is not, not a lot of women look at themselves down below. And I think it's also a fairly difficult place to look at. Unlike men, it's outside, but the vagina is a bit difficult unless you use a mirror. And I think that's probably a big reason also that we, women don't notice that there are changes, you know, from how it looks and the shape of it. Um, I think if moving forward, you know, maybe once a month if when you're checking your, your breast self-examination, which everyone should do, look at yourself with a mirror down below and, you know, take note of how, what's normal. And then if there's any changes, you, you'll be able to det detect it early. That's a very good point, because if you don't know what is normal, you won't know what is abnormal, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. While listening, I was thinking a candidiasis or trash um, also can happen, and that also can cause itchiness. Do you think that left not treated for a long time also can cause other problems? So candidiasis is just an overgrowth of the fungus and often triggered by when the good bacteria in the vagina is low, you know, especially if you've had a course of antibiotics for, let's say, a different problem because it kills off all the good bacteria or, or if you practice douching, which you shouldn't. Um, um, but long-term candidiasis, it's more of a nuisance than it is uh, a problem. It doesn't lead to cancer. It doesn't lead to any permanent damage. But candidiasis can be, or, or trash can be a very difficult thing to treat. And if let's say you've gone to the GP a few times and you had uh, the pessary done three times and it's not helping, it, it may be worth treating it as a long-term thing, like six months of you know, anti-trash medication. The other thing is trash also sits in the back passage and, and kind of lie there. So there's a lot of cross infection. So if you're not pregnant, you should also get treated with the antifungal as a tablet. Uh, and that kills off everything, you know, from the back passage and in the front and therefore preventing reinfection. Uh, in pregnancy, you can't take the tablet. It's not safe in pregnancy. That's why I mentioned that. But otherwise, everyone else who has trust should be treated orally and also vaginally. Sure. Thank you so much. The reason I ask is, as a dentist, we get patients with the trash in the mouth, and mm. then we do ask them, do you have it anywhere else, obviously, mm. but we are not experts in the, in the other areas of the body. So hence, I ask the question, really. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I know you are into gynecology. Just for the uh, benefit of men on this platform, do men have breast cancer, and should men self examine and go screening or prostate cancer because prostate uh -huh. cancer like breast cancer is one of the top four in the UK, right? Unfortunately, not my expertise, uh, but men do get breast cancer. We do have breast tissue, even all men do, except they are a lot smaller. Uh, but usually men who get breast cancer have strong family history, as far as I know. Uh, I, I'm probably speaking out of, out of my, my, my expertise now. Uh, and again, prostate cancer is another thing that, uh, you know, I think you can get blood tests done to screen for prostate cancer and uh, also, you know, a, a rectal examination can feel for the prostate. I, as far as I know, I don't think there's any established screening program for men uh, in terms of breast or, um, or prostate cancer. Uh, speaking of breast cancer in the men, uh, the BRCA gene is probably very important. So if 
if any man here has a very strong family history of breast cancer in women, you're probably, you know, at a higher risk and you need to be careful. Thank you. I'm sorry to ask the question because we have uh, an equal number of audits from more, um, uh, from men as well. So I just thought uh, you know, that should no, no, perhaps no. repeat that because there's a misunderstanding that you know men will never get breast cancer usually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. We're almost coming to the end of uh, this particular questioning and we will then, of course, all the audience will get the exclusive um, questions to you. What are the five things you would think every woman should know, must know, and make sure their you know, sisters, their children, grandchildren um, also know about gynecologic cancer or screening of them for that mm. matter? I think that's, that's a very good question. Uh, again, probably sounding like a broken record and repeating myself. I think taking charge of your own health is very important. I think the best person to rely on is yourself. Uh, smear test is the best or the most established screening tool in medical history. You know, not only just for, you know, in, in, even in other fields. So go for a smear test. Uh, I'm going to remind everyone that it should be a minimum of three yearly, every three years from the age of 26 to the age of 50. And after that, every five years. I know in certain countries uh, where there's no established screening program, you can get it done annually. But whether it's every year or every three years, it hasn't really shown any difference. Uh, so you probably can save a bit of money if you're paying for your own health. Um, secondly is know your cycles. Know what's normal for you. And if there's any abnormal bleeding, abnormal cycles, get help. Uh, and, and like self-breast examination that you do every month, I think you should have a look down below as well just to make sure that everything looks the same as it is the last one. Um, and also look into family history. I think if if you have PCOS or if you have a strong family history of any cancers, including breast and bowel, uh, get ask your GP or ask your any doctors whether you are really truly at higher risk or are all these other cancers more coincidental. And I think even after menopause, I think people have to be aware of these things because even a lot of women so. think menopause and that's it. We don't have to worry about it. Even more so, actually, because a lot of cancers happen in the older age. Uh, and lastly, stop smoking, exercise regularly, uh, reduce weight. The last bit, I'll take that. Thank you so much for sharing the knowledge because it's, I think it's very, very useful for many of us to know. Thank you so much. One last question. What has been your experience with the doctor? What are, you, what are your suggestions, feedback? And, oh, you mean with the talk? Yes. It's a very fun talk. Uh, casual, uh, I think it gives me, a, as, as a speaker, a good platform to to, to you know, increase awareness or to speak about what I want uh, to the audience to hear. Uh, I think uh, I think it's a great thing to, and you should keep doing this, you know. And and I can see from the records, you know, from your previous videos that it's a very diverse talk show, and and you know, there's so many, so much to learn, so much information to take on. Thank you so much. Really appreciate. I know you were very, very busy. welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Very uh, busy healthcare professionals like uh, many of us. And you just finished on call and came and still uh, spoke on the show. So thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and effort uh, for coming and enlightening us with this particular topic. So for people who are on the show, please remain there because we will be giving you the chance to ask the questions yourself or uh, please share the question. We will put it across for the speaker. Now, following tradition, I'm going to announce the show for the next week. It will be our 94th uh, episode, How to Thrive with Multiple Intelligence, maybe for relationship, for yourself, or even professional progress. How someone can thrive with multiple intelligence is as important as knowing about our health. We will be having Dr. Sonawat, who is the director of Ampersand Group. 
She was a former dean, professor, and head of department of the human development at University of Mumbai. She will be coming and talking about what we all can do to thrive with multiple intelligence. Now, over to Kirbe Kohut to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Meneghar. Once again, I'd um, like to thank all our Facebook viewers for faithfully coming on Facebook to, to support us and to listen to such an interesting uh, topic today. And also to all our participants on Zoom today. This subject is such an interesting and uh, so much to learn. And, um, and I'm really happy to... to that we together in Meet Menaga to host uh, Dr. Jun, who's also a Malaysian, proud to say um, he's a Malaysian. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jun, for, for bringing this uh, very intimate subject with such ease. And um, I'm sure your patients will be so comfortable to share their intimate uh, things to you because you have such a calmness about you. And I think it's and thank added you. value and a added a posture on your part. And we thank you for, for giving time to come and uh, grace our, uh, our show. And for all those who are on this uh, platform today, my question to you, to you all is, what do you choose to be a victim of cancer or a survivor of cancer? Remind yourself, do not forget to take all your screenings. Thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Jun. All the best. Thank you, Kirubai. Thank you, Dr. Jun, uh, for that uh, amazing talk. I know it is not the, one of the easiest topics to address, but you made it um, easy to understand, applicable, and you definitely made an impact for us to think. I know particularly cervical screening is not the easiest bit. As a woman, I know the pain of it, but what is the alternative is something for you to think about, right? So take control, like uh, Dr. Jun said it repeatedly. It is your health, your wellness, and you're responsible for it. So I think that's how I would uh, want to say, and uh, hopefully Dr. Jun agrees with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Jun, for that amazing talk. And people who are on the Zoom, please wait on. And for those who are on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us week after week and cheering us on and helping us to share this message far and wide. And for people who are on the platform on Zoom today, particularly for those men who have come and supported us to share this important uh, topic, um, which is really beneficial for your women. I'm sure you have a family member or friend uh, who can benefit from this knowledge as well. So huge thank you. A humble request again, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel so that we can make a bigger impact. And for people who are on the Facebook listening to us, it has come to that time of the day to say goodbye. Until we see you next week to talk about how to thrive with multiple intelligence with Dr. Sonawat. Until then, stay safe, be happy and keep smiling.